Mini episode 358 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.info. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Welcome to FDH Lounge in the episode number 358. This is FDH Managing Partner Rick Morris here, welcoming you to the start of our month-long 7th anniversary special. Throughout the actual anniversary date of January 14, 2014, we'll be bringing you many aspects of the program where nothing is off topic. With all due respect to an amazing guest list that we've had, today's guest is truly our undisputed legend of legends. And again, that's not to tell short the other guests in our lineage, from Tommy Lasorda and Tommy John to Gaylord Perry and Steve Perry, from Burt Randolph Sugar and Jerry the King Waller to Dominic Chianese and Pat Cooper, to Dickie Bartolo and Al Jaffe, to the San Diego Chicken, and Ziggy cartoonist Tom Wilson, to this gentleman's former CBS colleague Charles Osgood, and far beyond, we've been fortunate to talk to so many people who have truly lived the American dream, and yet any of them would be quick to tell you how proud they would be to have their name listed beside this gentleman. Our association with him began back in 2009, when we were fortunate to have Steve Servillo catch the attention of his publicist, Henry Bollinger, who is himself one of the most influential and accomplished members of the entertainment industry. Henry and his client consented to our first conversation. The fact that we have been able to bring him back four times subsequently is humbling beyond belief. In this gentleman's period of retirement from The Price is Right, during which he has stayed busy with many other ventures, Henry and he have trusted us to conduct informative and entertaining conversations that have kept his countless fans up to date on his life. That trust is one of the greatest personal or professional honors that will ever be bestowed upon me. It's in that spirit that we commissioned plaques designating the two of them as FDH Lounge dignitaries emeritus, putting their names right alongside the ensemble members who have worked so hard to create our 665-plus hours of content. For all of the big guests that we've been fortunate enough to welcome through our virtual doors, it's rare not to have to identify them with a job title or other identifier ahead of their name, but not this man. Every man, woman, and child in America knows who he is, and on the heels of his 90th birthday celebration and triumphant return to The Price is Right, we're very honored to welcome him back to the FDH Lounge for his fifth appearance. Once again, come on down to the FDH Lounge, Bob Barker. How are you today, sir? I am very well, and I'm uh, even more uh, enthusiastic and upbeat since I heard that introduction. I'm ready. Well. Great, great. Well, thank you, and I truly mean all of it. It's a, it's a privilege to be able to uh, have these conversations with you, and we've done them largely around special events in your life when you've had things going on, such as last week's 90th birthday celebration with the Price is Right return. It was a very, very special moment. I saw all of the footage and some of the behind-the-scenes footage that went up on the Internet afterward, and it looked like a great day. Did it really completely live up to your expectations? It was one of the most heartwarming days of my life. They were so nice to me, so good to me. Everyone on the show, from the producer right on down, everyone. And the folks came down from upstairs and said hello to me. The new head of daytime came down. Everyone just did everything they possibly could to make it a a nice day for me, and they certainly succeeded. Oh, that's outstanding because that's exactly the way that it came across on TV and certainly the good vibes of the people there and, and the uh, the guests that were on the show and uh, particularly uh, one of the contestants, Gail, with how she did there towards the end. It was very, very clear how much you have meant to people over the years in watching some of that footage. Well, thank you. I, I tell you, it's meant a lot to me over the years. I enjoyed every moment of it. I've been blessed. I had two shows, Truth or Consequences and Price is Right. I did them for more than 50 years and uh, never got up one morning and thought, oh, I don't want to go to the show today. I loved it. I had fun, and uh, I am grateful to the good Lord for 
making it possible for me. I I have great sympathy for anyone who uh, dreads going to the office or to his job, who looks forward to the weekend, looks forward to the vacations, looks forward to retirement. And uh, that's, a, that's a tough way to live. That is very difficult, certainly. And uh, that kind of attitude you've got has really sustained you over the years. And I've seen comments that you've made when you've been asked about the secrets to your longevity where you've referred to diet and exercise and some of the standard things that people would expect to hear. But I would have to think also from watching that last week, from hearing some of your other statements about uh, how, how your interaction has been with the public, that I would think that your fans have also probably helped keep you going over the years. I know in particular we got a message from one of our listeners, James Bubnick, who was watching last week and was feeling very inspired watching you on TV as he is on the verge of getting married and thinking ahead in his life and thinking ahead to hopefully having a nice long life and doing a lot of great things. And he said he felt a tremendous inspiration in watching you on there. I have to believe that's the kind of thing you hear quite a bit from people. Well, I uh, I do occasionally, and uh, I certainly wish that young man a long, happy marriage and uh, good health and all the good things. It, uh, nutrition and exercise are important at any age, but I think they're very important as you begin getting older. But also the fact that I enjoyed my work. I think that really kept me going as long as I did. I, I uh, worked until I was 83, and I uh, enjoyed it right up to the last moment. And that was very evident from watching the shows, no question about it. People could see how much you enjoyed it. And speaking of enjoyment, I have to say that in watching from last week, uh, I was kind of tickled to see the Whitey Herzog story pop up because I had heard <laughs> that from you first on our program when you had told us that one. And That's certainly right. your love of the uh, the St. Louis Cardinals is no secret. And you talked about it uh, at great length in your book, uh, Priceless Memories, which we had uh, discussed previously on the show. I have to think that uh, this run that the team made this past year had to be quite a big thrill for you, particularly when you look at the young players, the infusion from the farm system, and how bright the future seems. I have to say, as a Cleveland Indians fan, I am certainly very envious. You must be feeling, as a Cardinals fan, that you have nothing but good things to look forward to as far as the eye can see. Well, you uh, put it into words much better than I could. I was very impressed with their young people, uh, particularly that young a uh, Latin pitcher, I had forgotten his name, he's only 20 years old, and he went out there and he you'd think he was Dizzy Dean. He was just uh, splendid. They were really, really amazing. It was quite a run, and again, in looking at that, it, when we had spoken with you previously on the program, that was right about at the time of the 2011 World Series, some questions were starting to linger at that time about whether... Albert Pujols would still be around, and uh, unfortunately he was not after that series, although the team did win the World Series in 2011. But it's truly amazing, is it not, that this team, this franchise, has not skipped a beat since he moved on to L.A.? Well, you know, uh, Branch Rickey, back in his day, he started the Cardinal Farm, Cl uh, farm uh, System, and they are supposed to have one of the finest farm systems in baseball. And uh, that's one of the best ways to come up with these young players. They come up uh, from the time, some of them probably are 8, 16, 17, 18 years old down there playing for, for a minor league team. That's, that's how I became a Cardinal fan. I used to go down and visit my grandmother in Springfield, Missouri in the summertime, and uh, they were a farm club of the Cardinals. And I saw some fine players come through there, including greatest cardinal of all, Stan Musil. He came through there. Oh, he, was there for, he was in Springfield for about 15 minutes, and he went up to the big team. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, that's another thing, too, since we last spoke, the sad passing of us, uh, Stan Musial earlier this year. On the same day as Earl Weaver, I found that to be very, very striking, two of baseball's greatest legends in the same day. A sad day for baseball when that happens, Bob, no question. Again, that was when we had last spoken. It was around the time of the 2011 World Series. That was a very great moment for you, I know. What was a very sad moment for you was simultaneous. We spoke just on the heels, coincidentally, of the Zanesville Animal Massacre. We had set up the conversation prior to that, and that sad event unfortunately transpired in the meantime. And we got some very fresh comments from you at the time. You had some tremendous insight as to what was happening there. And what was going to be the state of matters going forward. And subsequently, my state of Ohio, which uh, unfortunately played host to that sad event. I know that we've got the 
exotic animal ban that's going into effect on January 1st. So there was some legislative uh, efforts that came out of that here. I know you've really got your finger on the pulse of what's going on all over the country. Has this been a trend since then of where municipalities and states have woken up and said we need to do something about this? They certainly have. State by state, we've accomplished various things. Right now, we're working on these gestation crates, which are hideous. And uh, believe it or not, in the state of New Jersey, we got uh, both houses of the state government to pass the bill, and it went to Christie, and he vetoed it. And I wrote a letter today, and I'm sure that thousands of people who know about this have written letters, and... uh, I I just can't imagine a man wanting so much to get the votes of the various people who are are profiting from this torture, these gestation crates. But he did, and uh, if he gets nominated uh, for president, I hope that every animal rights activist uh, either stays home or votes for the opposition. That is very surprising, Bob. I had not heard about that. That's that's shocking in light of, as you said, Chris Christie's rumored aspirations for president for 2016. That would appear to be political suicide, uh, one would think. And, and he is noted for being whatever else you might say, a very shrewd politician. Do you have it's any insights as to what su- was behind that? No, I have no idea. It's political suicide for for anybody who's interested in the animals. They're not going to vote for him. But uh, be that as it may, onward and upward, I tell you, that animal rights movement is moving like uh, you just uh, you can't believe it. It's not only increasing in uh, accomplishments, but it's doing it faster. And it's all through, it's all, much of it, you can attribute to the, to the media. Because here we are talking about it. There was a time we would no more be discussing animals it would just be the furthest thing from our minds. But now, radio, television, and newspapers are all talking uh, or writing about animals and the mistreatment of animals, and uh, possibly they're discussing the value of becoming a vegetarian. And uh, it, it it is really having an influence because uh, most Americans, 70% of the homes in the United States, are supposed to have at least one pet, but they they know their own pets and they love their own dogs or their cats or their goats or whatever they have, but uh, they don't know about the terrible mistreatment and the terrible exploitation of animals. And it's through the media that we're getting the word out, and when the Americans hear what's going on, they change it. Well, Bob, unsurprisingly, you just showed right there again your extensive broadcasting background and very well anticipating my next question, because I was going to ask you a follow-up about that, and you you started to go in that direction already. But as far as some of the major developments over the last couple of years, what do you find from your perch to be kind of the more noteworthy developments in advancing this? We talked about the negative of that bill not getting through in New Jersey. What are some of the bigger positives as you see them? Well, don't give up on that bill in New Jersey because we're trying to uh, get the the two houses of the legislature to uh, overcome his veto. But oh, okay. uh, the things that that are happening that are very impressive is so many. Uh, one thing, uh, the uh, searchlight of the truth has at last uh, shined on zoos and. We're getting, uh, we're making inroads there. We're getting animals out of zoos, and uh, we just got three elephants out of the Toronto Zoo, got down, got them down here to a wonderful sanctuary in nor- Northern California called uh, Paws. It's the nearest thing to, if an animal's going to be in captivity, Paws is the place for it because it's the nearest thing to their natural habitat. But uh, mm-hmm. I think that the... Uh, uh, the zoos know now that we're looking over their shoulder and they're treating their animals somewhat better. And the best zoos in the world, if there is such a thing as a good zoo, but the best known zoos in the world are closing their elephant exhibits completely. They've come to terms with the fact that an elephant cannot be happy and healthy in a zoo. And another uh, advancement that we're that we're making is factory farming these uh, undercover people the, the the people 
who, uh, with organizations like PETA and Mercy for Animals, they go undercover and they expose the horrors of factory farming, and we're making great advances there. And it's just, you name it, we've, we've made advancements in every facet of animal protection. We really have. Right now, they're shining the light on the American Humane Association, which has had the responsibility of presenting of, of uh, protecting animals in the production of movies. I know it's more than a half a century. It could be as much as 70 years. And I, I, in my opinion, they have failed miserably. Animals are still killed and uh, beaten and uh, crippled in movies. And uh, the American Humane Association has failed to protect them. They have never, to my knowledge, filed a, an animal abuse charge against an animal trainer in all those years. And you can make up your mind. You can bet your bottom dollar animal abuse has been rampant. So, so those are some of the things. I, you should never have asked. You get me wound up. I have a <laughs> hard time getting stopped. <laughs> well, no, and this is what people want to hear from you, Bob, because you are very plugged in on this. You're very knowledgeable and passionate, and uh, you're a tremendous source for what's going on with that. And uh, certainly your public is interested in, in hearing about these things. So uh, you are absolutely right as you're describing those. Those are very noteworthy uh, developments, and certainly zoo policy would not have changed were it not for the oversight of some of these groups. So that is very noteworthy as well. When it comes to taking a public stand on issues, you are, of course, best identified in the public eye with the animal rights movement. But from time to time, there have been some other things that have popped up as well. And I did just recently see on YouTube a commercial from down in Florida with this special election that's going on right now to fill the congressional seat of the late Bill Young, who I know was a friend of yours. You put out an endorsement recently for his former general counsel, David Jolly. So how did that come to pass uh, as far as your well, involvement in the race? Uh, his uh, widow, Beverly, uh, Bill, uh, Bill Young's widow, Beverly, called me and uh, asked me if I would uh, make a, a uh, spot for uh, David Jolly. And I knew David Jolly, and I knew he had been working with uh, Bill Young and for Bill Young, and I knew that uh, Bill Young was one of the best friends animals had in Congress and, and one of the best friends that uh, the military had in Congress. He was a wonderful man, just as kind as he could be and bright. But I, I, would, I happily uh, agreed to make a, a commercial for, for David Jolly because I think he's going to carry on in the same spirit that Bill Young acted. And I think he will represent his district splendidly. I remember from the time of Bill Young's passing, hearing so many great things about him from his colleagues and those who had dealt with him. I did not know that you were friends with him at the time, but I had heard the same thing independently from many different sources and how well regarded he was. And certainly this race is going to be watched very, very closely. And uh, again, whoever wins will be on the ballot again next November to defend that seat. But in terms of uh, a lot of the topics we've discussed uh, today, Bob, I know these are a lot of the ones that are the closest to your heart, whether it be the Price is Right, the St. Louis Cardinals, animal rights movement. Is there anything that we've missed thus far that we should talk about that you, that you would like your fans to know about in terms of what's going on with your life? No, I uh, am a complete success at retirement. I think I, <laughs> I think I am because I did it at just the right time. I didn't do it too soon. I didn't do it too late. I did it when I was still doing the show as well, I thought, uh, as I ever had. And uh, we were right up there um, leading in uh, ratings, and our show had become a part of Americana. Uh, it really uh, was uh, just a joy to be there. And I thought, why not go out on top? So I, I retired at 83, and... Uh, I certainly haven't been sitting and staring off into space. I think that's sad, and I don't think it's healthy when people do that. I've been, been so busy, in fact, I thought about going back into television to try to get some rest. But, uh, <laughs> my, my, uh, my, my chief thing uh, now is the animals. I, I've gone all over the country, all over the world, actually, the North American continent. I've uh, been up to Can Canada several times, but... I uh, work on behalf of animals, but I uh, I think that uh, we're making headway, and of course that's a joy. 
So uh, if, you, if you choose to retire, be sure that you have something that you really enjoy and something that you're really interested and not just uh, sit down and you'll soon get tired of that. Well, you're doing very well with that, Bob, no question about it. And, again, we're just so pleased to be able to have the chance to be able to uh, catch up with you. It is one of the greatest honors of, of my life. If anybody ever says, Rick, what are some of the greatest things to have happened to you, I would put uh, these conversations right there. It's just a real honor and privilege to be able to do this and hope to do this and catch up with you again at some point down the road, Bob. Thank you so much for coming to our program. Well, it's always a joy to be with you, and this is number five. Five, yes. Five. Looking forward well, to six. <laughs> I have enjoyed talking with you this time, and I've enjoyed talking with you every time, and I look forward to the next time. Thank you so much, Bob. A true privilege. And thank you all for joining us today, everyone, for FDH Lounge Mini Episode number 358 with Bob Barker. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Paper Mate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements.